Hey church, how are you? Good. Can you give another great big God bless you to all our volunteers today? Amazing. Um, I finally get to say this to the church when I'm preaching, and that is good afternoon. We've always said good morning, and now we finally get to say good afternoon. Welcome to the first second service. So glad that you can all make it. Hopefully you came here by intention and not because you woke up late. <laughs> but it's so good to have you all anyways. Now, before we get into the word, just a quick word. Um, we want to thank God for leading us into this amazing new season where we can have two services. I'm so glad that even um, uh, at 11.30, our online friends can join us. And here's what we can do actually as a church to get into uh, the groove of what God is doing. So three quick words before we get into the sermon. Number one is, how do we get, into, how do we get the most of this experience in this new season? Number one, come early. Because the services are so packed and so timely that it's so good that we can come early to find our seats, you settle down and then you get into the groove of listening and expecting God's word and His presence. Come early. Second thing is come expected. God would not lead us into this new season if God had not something amazing and wonderful for all of us. So as we come into the service, come expecting that God will speak, that you will encounter God. And the last thing is come to the front. So as much as you can, come to the front, right? Uh, this is FCC, this is not the sea world where you're watching a show and there's, there are whales and dolphins splashing water. There is no splash zone in the first few weeks. Uh, not first few years, first few rows. <laughs> I'm one of the preachers that splash the most, so I'm the culprit, okay? But I promise you that even if you sit on the first row, you will still be out of the splash zone. So come early, come expectant, and come to the front. And um, our amazing welcome team is here to help us to maximize this experience collectively, together. So listen out to what they say. They'll guide us to the right seats, to the right place, so that we can have the best experience together as a church. Yes? Amen? You hear that? Oh, amen. So good. So come FCC, let's do the three. All right, come early, come expect, and come to the front. How many of us are excited for the word today? I'm actually really excited because as I did the study, I feel like God is teaching me so much, and I can't wait to share this word with you. So we're, we're on this series called, Is Life Worth Living? And today's sermon is on the same lines called, Is Wealth Worth Pursuing? And what uh, uh, the teacher Solomon is trying to teach us now is on the topic of wealth. We're about halfway through Ecclesiastes. He has talked about toil, he's talked about wisdom, he's talked about pleasure, and how he finds everything to be meaningless. Now he's turning to the topic of wealth and how uh, he understands wealth and shows us that it too is meaningless. So let's listen to what he says in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 8 to chapter 6, verse 12. Let's read it together. If you see the poor oppressed in a district and justice and rights denied, do not be surprised at such things. For one official is eyed by a higher one, and over them both are others higher still. The increase from the land is taken by all, and the king himself profits from the fields. Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This too is meaningless. As goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owners except to feast their eyes on them? The sleep of a laborer is sweet, whether they eat little or much, but as for the rich, their abundance permits them no sleep. I have seen a grievous evil under the sun, wealth hoarded to the harm of its owners or wealth lost through misfortunes, so that when they have children, there is nothing left for them to inherit. Everyone comes naked from their mother's womb, and as everyone comes, so they depart. They take nothing from their toil that they can carry in their hands. This too is a grievous evil. As everyone comes, so they depart, and what do they gain since they toil for the wind? All their days they eat in darkness with great frustration, affliction, and anger. Now this is what I observe to be good, that it is appropriate for a person to eat, to drink, and to find satisfaction in their toilsome labor under the sun during the few days of life God has given them, for this is their lot. Moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and be happy in their toil, this is a gift of God. 
They seldom reflect on the days of their life because God keeps them occupied with gladness of heart. I have seen another evil under the sun and it weighs heavily on mankind. God gives some people wealth, possessions, and honor so that they like nothing their hearts desire. But God does not grant them the ability to enjoy them and strangers enjoy them instead. This is meaningless, a grievous evil. A man may have a hundred children and, and live many years, but yet no matter how long he lives, if he cannot enjoy his prosperity and does not receive a proper burial, I say that a stillborn child is better off than he. For it comes without meaning, it departs in darkness, and darkness its name is shrouded. And though it never saw the sun or knew anything, it has more rest than does the man. Even if he lives a thousand years twice over, but fails to enjoy his prosperity, do not all go to the same place? Everyone's toil is for their mouth, yet their, their appetite is never satisfied. What advantage have the wise over the fools? What do the poor gain by knowing how to conduct themselves before others? Better what the eye sees than the roving of the appetite. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Whatever exists has already been named and what humanity is has been known. No one can contend with someone who is stronger. The more words, the less meaning. So how does that profit anyone? For who knows what is good for a person in life during the few and meaningless days they pass through like a shadow? Who can tell them what will happen under the sun after they are gone? That's a long one, but it's a good one. In this passage that we have read, the teacher came back to his favorite word, meaningless, 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 or in Hebrew, havel. And we have, we have talked about this word many times, but it's really good that on this halfway mark in our series, week seven of week 14, let's revisit what havel means. And I think it's really important for us to understand this passage. So there are four things I want to say about that. Number one, let's remember that Ecclesiastes is a poetry book. And the teacher, Solomon, is a poetry man. He's a poet. So he communicates primarily through metaphors, vivid imagery, pictures. That's number one that we must remember. Number two, the word havel in Hebrew, which is meaningless, is a noun. It's not an adjective. It's not something that is a descriptive. It's an actual thing itself. And literally, the word meaningless or havel refers to the word vapor, mist, steam, smoke. So it's kind of like saying, I ate a McSpicy from Macca's last night, and, Mac and the McSpicy was really juicy. That is an adjective, you're describing it. But another way to say it is, the McSpicy, when I ate it, is the bomb. The bomb is a noun, is a thing. And what that literally means is when you're eating it, it feels like it's juicy, it's tender, it tastes so good. When it goes down to your stomach, it, it explodes with fire and spice and it makes you hurt all inside. It is the bomb. In the same way, meaningless is vapor. It's a thing. And so maybe here's what we can do to help us to understand. Like all of us, if you can, just take out your phones right now. Somebody told me, um, I came from a church that, this morning they said, I came from a church that you can't bring phones <laughs> into the service. Not in FCC, you can take out your phone. So if you have your phone in front of you, put your mouth really close to it. Uh, if you're watching this online, please don't kiss the screen because I'm on the screen. It will look really awkward when you do so, when you're kissing the screen. So try to avoid that. Have a little bit of distance and now breathe with your mouth on it. <sighs> and look at it. One more time. Let's breathe on it. Can you see the vapor, the mist that is on the phone? It's, it's there for a moment, and it looks like it will stay, but it quickly fades away. It looks like you can touch it almost, but you can't really hold on to it. This is what meaningless or havel means. It's like vapor. You see it, you can't hold on to it. It looks like it's there, but very quickly it disappears. So this is what meaningless means. And if we understand meaningless, then the word meaningless is actually quite meaningful in amazing ways, isn't it? Howard Hughes is American. He was an American back in the 1900s. At the age of 40, he was super duper rich. 
He made a lot of movies. One of the most famous ones is uh, called Scarface. Maybe some of us who are older, you know the movie. He made the movie. And he had many actresses for his girlfriends. He led a very glamorous life. He had a few wives. He flew and test piloted exotic planes. He owned a string of hotels. He even had an airline for himself. He was rich, he was powerful, he was famous. And 20 years later, at the age of 60, he was just as rich, okay? He had the equivalent of 10 billion Aussie dollars. That was his net worth, super duper rich. He had everything in life, but the world's richest, one of the world's richest men was also sadly one of his most pathetic. What happened was Howard would lock himself up in a small dark room atop a hotel. He spent his whole day and every day locked up in a room. He would not come out. He would be naked walking around his room. And then he would watch movies over and over and over again. For one particular movie, they said he watched 150 times. By the time he was 60, his beard has grown all the way to his waist, doesn't trim himself. His hair has grown all the way down his back because he doesn't care about his hygiene. His fingernails were two inches long, and this is not for fashion, okay? It's because he didn't care anymore. Two inch long fingernails. And finally, at the age of 70, this man who had everything in life, but life held no meaning for him, he finally passed away out of kidney failure and ironically, malnutrition for a lack of appetite for food. Now, Howard Hughes is an extreme example of somebody who is suffering from a syndrome that plagues even the wealthiest and the most rich of us. Now, the teacher, King Solomon, had everything that he could have, right? As a king, he owned a lot. And he's just as old and he's just as rich and he looks back in life and he says, I thought about wealth and about life and this is what I think. He comes up with two conclusions and let's turn to them today. Number one, he found that wealth does not satisfy. In chapter five, verse 10, he says this, whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This too is meaningless, it's vapor. And maybe some of us are saying, well, Pastor Dan, I think I'm okay because I'm not rich. I don't have a lot of money. But what the Bible doesn't say is whoever has money, whoever has wealth. What the Bible says is whoever loves money, who, whoever loves wealth. And how many of us know today that you don't need a lot of money or wealth to love it? You can love it even though you don't have a lot. So the teacher isn't warning us about wealth by itself. He's warning us about the love of money. It is not money or wealth that is the problem. It's the love of money and wealth. There's this famous man called John D. Rockefeller who was the first billionaire of the United States back in the 1800s. So in New York City, if you go to Manhattan right now, in Midtown Manhattan, there is this big area called the Rockefeller Center. And every New Year's Eve, they will always have that celebration at Rockefeller's. This Rockefeller Center, the whole land was named after him, John D. Rockefeller, because he was the wealthiest man of his time and he owned a lot. And one day in his life, a, a man, a person came up to John Rockefeller and asked him, sir, how much money is enough? How much money is enough? And at, as the perfect definition of the love of money, Rockefeller replied, just a little bit more just a little bit more. You see, brothers and sisters, whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied. So how do we know today if we have this love of money, maybe it, 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 even if it's just a little bit, how do we know if we love money and wealth today? I think that there are many ways to tell, but one of the ways that I think we can tell and, tell and check ourselves is how generous are we? How stingy are we, or how generous are we towards ourselves? Maybe some of us have been living with socks with three holes, including the one that you put your foot into. You got multiple holes already and you're still wearing it. But I don't want to, I, I don't want to uh, buy a new one, I just want to keep wearing it. Or you actually have the money to pay for one. How many of us actually have the money to go for a nice meal, but we're always eating frozen pizzas and chips for our meals? We're not generous to ourselves. And maybe some of us are not generous to us, other people too. You know, I'm, a, I'm an Asian person, so I come from an Asian culture. And many times when we have meals as Asians, right? We sit around the table, we have a nice meal. At the end of the meal, what happens? The bill comes and automatically, automatically everybody fights to pay for the bill. 
Now let me do it. No, pastor, you're the pastor. Let me pay for it. No, I'm the oldest. You listen to me. You sit down and I'll pay for it. And some, maybe some of us, we, we are like the guy with the hand in the pocket and it's like our hands and our wallet is stuck. Oh, oh, it doesn't come out. It doesn't come out. And finally, when it comes out, it's because somebody has already paid for it. I said, ah, I'm slow this time, but thank you so much for paying for my meals. And it happens over and over and over again. Then, you know, maybe I'm not generous towards other people. Or maybe some of us, we, we, we know that God has called us to tithe and to offer up to Him our money. And we're always holding back. God, not this month, you know, not this month. Wait for it, God. Wait, wait, wait for it, wait for it, wait for it. And it, it never comes. We never give God what is due to Him. Maybe we're, we're not generous to ourselves or to other people or even to God. How, one of the things I, I've learned in life is this. You can give without loving. You can give without loving. Isn't that true? You can give to SPCA, you can give to Save the Children Foundation without loving the children. You can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. When you love, you will always give. That's why in the famous verse, John 3, 16, it says, for God so loved the world that He gave. Because love gives. When we love our family, we give unreservedly to our family. Isn't that true? You want to give your best, your best time, your best money. You want to provide the best for your children. When you're in love with your boyfriend and girlfriend, especially the early days when you're in love, money is no matter. I keep giving. I'll buy this for you. I'll buy that for you. I'll pay this for you. It doesn't matter because love gives. But in the same way, when we love money, when we love wealth, we end up giving to it as well. Did you know that? What do we give? Sometimes we give our time to pursuing wealth. You spend a lot of energy pursuing wealth. Maybe for some of us, we are constantly tired when we come home. Our children and our spouses want to talk to us, but we are sitting at a dining table just eating our meals like, I had a really hard day, you know, it's, it's just very tiring for me. Please, okay, just leave me alone for a little bit. I'll, we'll talk tomorrow. And you find yourself doing that over and over and over again. Maybe we're not giving to what really matters, which is our family. We're giving to something else that tells us, that, that directs us towards a, a, a love of money. Maybe that's what's happening. So you give to what you love. And the wise teacher says that when you reach my position as Solomon, and you have everything on this planet Earth, you're rich, you're wealthy, then you will come to the same conclusion as I. And that is, wealth doesn't really satisfy. It doesn't get you the sense of happiness. In the end, it's like vapor that you can see, but you can't really hold on to, says the teacher. And in verse 12, he says this, the sleep of a laborer is sweet, whether they eat little or much, but as for the rich, their abundance permits them no sleep. So he turns from the pursuit of money or wealth now to the possession of wealth. When you do have it, he says, even the simple laborer has better sleep and rest than you do. The rich man, because of the abundance that he has, he can't sleep. Now, it's not that the rich man doesn't want to sleep well. He wants the same sleep as everybody, same peace as everybody but is that his richness, his wealth, his abundance doesn't allow him to. Sometimes it's not just what we want that consumes us. It's also what we have already that consumes us. We're worried about our investments. We're worried about our house. We're worried about our cars. We're worried about our careers that we already have. When it comes to wealth, the more we have, the more we have to lose. And that's what the teacher is saying here. So for the teacher, the wealth, wealth doesn't really satisfy. In fact, the love of wealth has this insidious way of eating, eroding away at the, at the satisfaction that we can have in this present moment. Because when it comes to the love of wealth, you will lose sleep and peace either over how you can obtain it or how you might lose it. So wealth doesn't really satisfy, says the teacher. Number two, the second observation he makes is this. Wealth does not stay. And in verse 14, he says this. Wealth lost through some misfortune so that they have children, and there is nothing left for them to inherit. And, and he's talking about a man here who's like many of us, 
who have children, we have a legitimate reason to guard our wealth and to grow our wealth. Why? Because we love our children. We want to give them the best. We want to give them something left over for them when they grow up. And yet what happened to this man is that the fruit of his labor was taken away from him through misfortune. In the Hebrew, this word misfortune literally means bad business. It's a bad investment that went belly up. It's a bad business venture that came to bite him back. It's a, it might be a bad business partner that ran away with the money and had unethical business practices. Or it might be a mishap that happened to you that you didn't foresee and you lost your money. So he says that money is literally easy come and easy go. As easy as you can get money, so quickly can you also lose it. Easy come, easy go. And then he goes on in the next verse to say, naked come, naked go. Look at what he says. Everyone comes naked from their mother's womb. And as everyone comes, so they depart. Isn't that true? When you were born, you didn't come with clothes. You didn't come with socks and cute little mittens and a nice little beanie on your head. None of us were born with all these things. We came naked. And in the same way, when we leave this earth, we will leave naked as well. For they take nothing from their toil that they can carry in their hands. So what is the teacher's point? He says, wealth doesn't stay. Either wealth will leave you because of something that happens to you, or you will leave it because you die and you will have to leave this planet. So wealth doesn't really stay with you. That's what he's trying to say. So instead, what do you get from trying to pursue wealth in this life? He says in verse 16 to 17, of the people who pursue wealth, all their days they eat in darkness, they consume what they have, not in bright light and happiness, but in a cold, dark place. They consume their wealth in darkness. And with what? With great uh, frustration. Frustration at what? That your wealth is slowly slipping away, that you don't really get satisfied by it. And the second thing is affliction. Literally what this means is sickness. Sickness of heart because your wealth causes you distress, stress, anxiety, and fears. And also sickness of body because you might have spent your entire health trying to pursue wealth. And at the end of the day, it doesn't satisfy. Or anger, he says. Why? Because you lost money in an unfair way. You try to chase after the money and then when you finally had it, it goes away from you and it's unfair, that loss. And you're angry with yourself, with God, with other people. This is what happens. And when we finally go, the cycle of life is complete. We came with nothing and we will leave with nothing. Because when it comes to money, brothers and sisters, you can save money, but at the end of the day, money cannot save you. Isn't that true? And one day we will all have to depart and money doesn't stay, our wealth doesn't stay with us. And maybe at this stage we're going, okay, Pastor Dan, I get it, I get it. I get what the teacher is saying. Wealth doesn't satisfy and wealth doesn't stay. But we still need to have money, right? We still need to have wealth, right? So what do we do? So in conclusion, not, not my conclusion, otherwise this is the shortest sermon ever, 20 minutes, wow, today's sermon is really good because it's 20 minutes. But the teacher's conclusion, he says this, enjoy what you have now. So therefore, enjoy what you have now. In verse 19, he says this, moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and be happy in their toil, this is a gift from God. He says wealth is a gift from God. Whatever that we have and we will have, is something that God has given to us. You don't have to fight for it. God gives. But at the same time, there is another gift that God gives, and that is the ability to enjoy what He has given us. And the teacher says, this is good. Now, the teacher doesn't say good many times throughout the book of Ecclesiastes. In fact, he's a party pooper. He's a wet blanket. He's somebody whom you would never want to invite to your birthday party because he's like that friend you know that friend that we all have, that if you invite him to the birthday party, at the end of the happy birthday to you, he will sing the next line, and you are going to die too. 
He, he gives you a, 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 a picture of reality, a dose of reality. He's like that friend, you know? When you go to baby showers, it's like, oh, we celebrate this baby, this baby is so cute, just born, and then he says, well, the moment the baby started living, the baby also started dying, the cells are already dying, you know? He reminds you of all these realities. So he doesn't say good things, but in here he says, no, no, verse 18, this is good. So when he says good, let's focus on that and see what does he mean by good. There's one thing that I, I, I learned as a parent. Um, you see, I love ice cream. When I was dating my wife, Vanessa, we ate a lot of ice cream. Ice cream is the way to a woman's heart, guys. It's true. And I love ice cream. And I, I ha so I have a son, he's six years old, his name is Jude, and he loves ice cream too. So every time when I wanna buy an ice cream for myself, I have to buy one for him because life is fair, right? Life is fair. So he, he needs to have one and I have one. So we eat the ice cream and this I realized. When I eat ice cream, I will hold the ice cream cone with, no, my favorite, my favorite is chocolate. So I eat chocolate and I'll lick it for two seconds, savor it. It's really good for two seconds. And on the third second, my mind begins to think about the future. Today is 33 degrees Celsius. Oh my gosh, it's so hot. In 10 seconds, this thing is gonna melt. It's gonna drip all over my hands and I don't like mess. It's gonna drip on my fancy white shoes and my jacket and it's all gonna get all crumbly in me. Yeah, I don't like that. I don't like that. And, and I like to eat my ice cream. I don't like to drink my ice cream. I want to have it now. And so within two minutes, I finish the whole thing. And then I turn to my son who is still having the whole ice cream, you know, and he's licking it. This is the, you know, kids, right? Every ice cream you give them is like, this is the best thing ever. Right? And then they will say, this is the most awesome day ever. Right? For them, it, they're enjoying that moment. So he's enjoying the ice cream. Licking it, saving all his chocolatey goodness. And it's so creamy, so rich, so thick. I know many of us want to have an ice cream right now because it's so hot, right? And, and you, he's licking, he's eating it, chewing. And even if it melts all over his hands, it doesn't matter. He's licking it. <laughs> so good. And when it's melted and it's all in the cone, he bites the bottom. Um, and then he starts sucking it from the bottom. <laughs> he's enjoying it. And when I eat ice cream with my son, I learned something. It's one thing to be having an ice cream. It's another thing to be enjoying the ice cream. And I think life is like that. Many times we have possessions, we have wealth, we have a house, we have a car, we, we have clothes on our bag. We have it, but we don't quite enjoy it. We can have a nice meal before us. It can be a very nice pizza or fish and chips, but it's one thing to have the fish and chips, it's another thing to be enjoying the fish and chips. It's one thing to come to church and to say, FCC is a great church, we have a wonderful service, I'm having this wonderful worship experience. It's another thing quite different to say, I'm enjoying the worship service and enjoying the presence of God. It's one thing even to, to have the Bible, many of us have the Bible, at our homes, on our desks, but it's quite another thing to read the Bible and to say, I'm enjoying the Bible. I'm enjoying the Word of God. It's different to have and to enjoy something. And the teacher is drawing that for us out here. And he gives a, an illustration. He tells a story of someone who has it all, but cannot enjoy it. Listen to what he says in chapter 6, verse 3 to 6. A man may have a hundred children and live many years. Yet no matter how long he lives, if he cannot enjoy his prosperity and does not receive proper burial, I say that a stillborn child is better off than he. Now this sounds confusing, but in Hebrew, in the original Hebrew, there is no punctuation. There is no comma, full stop, semicolon. So everything is all in one sentence. And when you translate it into English, you have to decide which part of the sentence this, uh, uh, sticks with which. So some translators translate it this way. Proper burial belongs to the man. But there is another way to translate it. The Common English Bible does this, where he, where he reads something like that. If he cannot enjoy his prosperity, then I say that a stillborn child who, has, who doesn't have a proper burial, because the baby died in the womb, or when he came out and there is no tombstone, it is better off than he. This man has everything, says the teacher. And the teacher draws it all out. He says, this guy has a hundred children. How many of us would like to have a hundred children? <laughs> Awkward pauses to your spouse as you look to one another. Yeah, yeah, maybe. 
He has a hundred children, impossible. So the teacher is drawing extreme example here. A hundred children, he has a lot, he has possessions. And he has a long life, longevity. Offspring, possessions, and longevity is everything a man in that era desired. So the teacher is saying, this man has everything that a man could ever ask for, except the ability to enjoy what he has. And because of that, even though a stillborn child, they both live like a vapor, they came and gone like smoke, right? Short lives. And even though the, the, the both of them went to death in darkness, and they both came with nothing and left with nothing, even though they're both similar, the one difference between the man and the stillborn child is this, the baby has more rest. In the New Living Translation, it says he has more peace, more calm, more stillness. In other words, less anxiety, less stress, less worries than the man. This is what it is like for us if we have what we have, but have not the ability to enjoy it. So it's really important that we learn to enjoy what God has given to us. So the teacher teaches us, how do we enjoy these gifts that God has given to us? The teacher teaches us two things. He describes for us people who do enjoy God's gifts. He says, number one, they accept their lot. Literally what this means is what is allocated to them, their heritage by God. They accept what's given to them by God and they are happy in their work. In other words, be content and enjoy the present. Enjoy what you have right now. And the second thing he says is this, well, they seldom reflect on the days of their life. What this means is they seldom think about the days ahead of them. They don't dwell on the uncertainties of the future because none of us can control the future. Jesus says this in, in, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 34, he says, don't worry about tomorrow. Let tomorrow worry about itself, for every day has worries of its own. And the teacher is drawing us the same example right here. Martin Luther, the, the great reformer who started the Lutheran churches all around the world back in the 1500s, he says this about this text. Solomon intends to forbid vain anxieties so that we may happily enjoy the things that are present and not care at all about the things that are in the future, lest we permit the present moment, our moment, in fact, the only moment that you and I have right now, to slip away. So enjoy the present. So what the teacher is saying here in summary is God's gift is twofold. It's both to have and to be happy. Do you have today, but you are not really happy? Do you not have today? and you're looking for happiness. God's gift is both for you to have enough and to be happy with what you have. And maybe some of us are asking, is it possible to have wealth and to be happy apart from God? The teacher would say, impossible. It's not possible. Why? Because he already told us, wealth doesn't satisfy. Wealth doesn't stay. He already said that. And then he goes on to ask these two questions in verse 12. For who knows what is good for a person in life? What is good? Who knows? Who knows? And then he goes on to say, who can tell them what will happen? Who knows? Who can tell? And he doesn't need to give us the answer. He, in fact, he doesn't give us the answer because he already planted clues in the verses before that. Look at verse 10 when he says this. Whatever exists has already been named. And what humanity is has been known. No one can contend with someone who is stronger. He's giving us three clues, brothers and sisters, to who he's talking about. Who created the earth and named the stars, the sky, the land, the seas, the animals? God, in Genesis chapter one. God named everything that was created, God. Clue number one, God. Who knows humans? Who created humans? God did. Clue number two, God again. And number three, who is stronger than humankind? In the book of Job, it says that, God, you overpower us as humans. You are stronger than all of us. Clue number three, God. God, God, God. So the answer to the wise man's questions, who knows, who can tell, is two things. He's answering two, two things. One, he's saying, not you, not me. 
because you and I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We are a lot less strong than we think we are. We are a lot less in control of life and tomorrow than we would like to believe. Not you, not me, we don't know. But he's also saying number two, God knows, God can tell. Because God is more powerful than us, He's stronger than us, and He's much more in control than we often realize. The Danish theologian Soren Kierkegaard, when he wrote a commentary on the book of Ecclesiastes, he says this, when Solomon says that all is vapor, all is vanity, the point of destabilizing our trust in earthly goods, all the wealth and work and pleasure and all those things, the point of pulling the, the rug from under our feet is not to leave us hanging like, oh my gosh, what's gonna happen? Life is so unstable, life is not worth living. I don't know what's gonna happen to me tomorrow. Nothing is, 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 you know, is, is stable in my life. That's not the point. But he's pointing us towards somewhere else where we can hang our trust and to trust in this unshakable foundation. And that is namely God. That is God. Why? Because God created you and I. Because God made us so He knows us. Because God loves us so He is worth trusting. I don't know what's gonna happen to me to God, to me to God tomorrow. I don't know what my wealth or what my finance or what my career is gonna be like tomorrow. I don't know if I have enough money to hand over to my children tomorrow, God, but I will turn my eyes on you because you are that, that unshakable, trustworthy foundation. I will stop pursuing wealth and pursuing my career, pursuing my possessions, because I know at the end of the day, somehow they will not satisfy. But I know in you, God, that there is a gift that I can have that will truly satisfy me, that will enrich my life, that will give me joy and peace and foundation on which I can live my life every day. I turn my pursuit now to you, God. Today's message, we heard that wealth doesn't satisfy, it doesn't stay. So the best thing to do is to enjoy what we have in the moment. And even though God's gift is both to have and to be happy, but we learn also, more importantly, that it's impossible to have and to be happy without God. We need God. Pastor theologian in America, John Piper, he says this, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him. Are you satisfied in God today? Is your trust hanging on God today? And he goes on to say this, the chief end of mankind, of you and I, is to glorify God by enjoying Him forever. God made you and I to enjoy Him, to be satisfied in Him. Church, would you just stand on your feet right now as we get into the time of worship and prayer? You put aside your Bibles and your books. And for those of us who are online, just listen to what I'm going to say. Young people, I want to speak to you for a little bit. Young people, kinetic, vibe, impact. Let me speak to you particularly in this instance. You know, wealth doesn't satisfy, wealth doesn't stay. We kind of know that, right? Millennials, Gen Zs, we know this instinctively because we grew up in a world that teaches us that wealth doesn't really satisfy. It, your purpose is not in wealth. So many of us, we see wealth not as something to pursue, but it's the means in which we can pursue something else. Sense of meaning, purpose, call. So what do we do? Maybe many of us, we work three days a week, four days a week, so that we have enough money to do what we really love, what gives us joy. We can be a barista, we want to be a musician, we want to be a singer, we want to travel the world, we want to be a photographer, we want to do social justice and to have social activism, social entrepreneurship. All those things are good. We understand instinctively that wealth doesn't lead us there necessarily, but we want to pursue all these things. And even though the world is pointing our millennials and our Gen Zs to that direction, I want to tell you something right now, that the world doesn't have the answer to your sense of fulfillment, your purpose, your call. It always over-promises and under-delivers. 
Because you were made to be with God. Your purpose was made to be in His image. God wants you to be enjoying Him, to be satisfied in Him. So your purpose and your sense of call, your sense of satisfaction and enjoyment can only be found in God. And that's really important, young people. So today, we want to turn our eyes in pursuit of God. And we're going to go into this beautiful song. And in the bridge, it says this, Your goodness is running after me. Your goodness is pursuing me. When you pursue God, you will find that you are not the one running after God. God is running after you. He's chasing after you. God wants you. And if today your heart is to say, yes, God, I say yes to you. I want to pursue you with everything that I have. Then I invite you to come to the front and we will pray with you. Come during the song and they will pray with you. The leaders will be at the front. Let's worship.